The United States Office of Government Ethics leads and oversees the Executive Branch Ethics Program, which is at work every day in more than 130 agencies. In order to support ethics officials in their work, OGE issues legal advisories to provide guidance on thorny ethics issues. Recent legal advisories have included updates on social media and cryptocurrency. OGE issued legal advisory LA 2310 on July 11th, 2023. It provides guidance on the application of certain ethics rules and regulations to executive branch employees who are serving on detail at another government agency. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, a detail does not have a statutory definition, but is generally understood to mean the temporary assignment of an employee to a different position for a specified period of time, with the employee returning to regular duties at the end of the detail. I'm Anna Wheeler, a senior instructor with the Institute for Ethics and Government. I'm joined today by Leah Stromberg, Associate Counsel, and Jenna Mazella, Assistant Counsel, both in the Ethics Law and Policy Branch. They have agreed to discuss the advisory and put it in context. Uh, thank you for joining us. Leah, let's start with you. Why did OGE issue this legal advisory? What prompted OGE to act on this issue? Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for that introduction, and it is great to be here with you and Jenna today. I want to start at the top to give a brief overview of how this topic was even selected for an advisory opinion. Prior to coming to OGE, I spent several years on the agency side as an ethics attorney, and one of my big questions was always, how does OGE select topics for advisory opinions? Well, OGE collects questions it receives from agencies and it analyzes the data. In that database of questions asked and answered over the years, one reoccurring topic was questions surrounding interagency detailees. Prior to joining OGE, I was familiar with OGE's 2006 guidance on IPA detailees, DO 06031, and you may be familiar with that one as well. But when Jenna and I received this assignment, we reviewed all of the questions OGE had received about interagency detailees, and we began to think about all of the ways the ethics rules might be applied inconsistently to these employees. We also considered how problematic this might be from OGE's perspective, because as the supervising ethics office for the executive branch, one of OGE's objectives is to make sure the rules are being applied consistently throughout the agencies to the extent appropriate. Here, interagency detailees need advance notice of their ethics responsibilities in order to stay within the requirements, regardless of which executive branch agency they are assigned to. Thanks, Leah. Jenna, turning to, to you, how did OGE develop this advice and write this advisory? Sure, and let me say, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you about this advisory today. So, as Leah mentioned, we saw in our internal records that questions related to interagency detailees have regularly arisen over the years. Reviewing those questions helped us determine the appropriate scope for this legal advisory and the areas that would be most helpful to address. OG also received feedback from agencies on this issue. From that feedback, we learned that agencies had different understandings and approaches for issues relating to interagency detailees. As we reviewed the ethics laws and regulations as well, including our prior guidance, we saw that in certain areas, the appropriate application of a given law or regulation to interagency detailees was clearly dictated. In other areas, however, the law was silent or unclear. And in those areas, we developed our guidance based on policy considerations and our understanding of agency practice and interests. Given the number of areas we address in this legal advisory, as well as their differing conclusions, LA 2310 also includes a job aid to help ethics officials quickly reference and resolve potentially thorny issues. So OGE saw the opportunity to offer some guidance on issues that many ethics officials throughout the government have been wrestling with. That's right. Part of our goal was to help agencies preserve practices that work for them, while also acknowledging that there is another agency involved that has a real interest in the detailee's ethical obligations. We intentionally built flexibility into the process where possible, specifically where the conclusions were not already dictated explicitly by law. In those areas, 
While we provide some best practices in the advisory, we knew after working through this issue internally that the ways in which agencies address ethical issues for interagency detailees can take different shapes. Now, getting to the substance of the advisory, what are the important points for ethics officials to understand about detail use? Well, before diving into the advisory itself, we want to emphasize that this advisory applies to interagency detailees, not IPA detailees. Although there is no statutory definition of an interagency detailee, these are essentially employees that work in one executive branch agency, their home agency, that go to work on a temporary basis with another executive branch agency, the receiving agency. For example, you can imagine a full-time employee in the Department of Education that goes to work for six months in the State Department. Sometimes the de these details are reimbursable, meaning the receiving agency pays the employee's salary. Sometimes they're non-reimbursable, meaning the home agency pays. But for purposes of this advisory, which agency is paying the employee's salary does not make a difference. The key point is that these are executive branch employees detailed to another executive branch agency. Thanks, Jenna. Leah, can you discuss the job aid that OG developed as part of LA 2310? Sure. So this advisory took a really comprehensive look at different places a detailee might run into the ethics program. We looked at the standards of conduct, agency supplementals, financial disclosure, and even training. That is a really broad advisory which we think will be great because it should leave you with a comprehensive understanding of how interagency detailees fit into the ethics program. But practically, things are coming at you fast and you are probably only going to be looking at one or two discrete issues at a time. You know, does this person need to file a financial disclosure report? Do they need to complete our agency's prior approval requirement for outside activities? For that reason, we came up with this job aid, which should be a quick way to get answers to your questions without having to reread through the entire advisory. We encourage you to look to review the job aid and keep it on hand for issues relating to interagency detailees. We'll also reference the job aid throughout this discussion to help everyone keep track of where we are. That's really helpful, Leah. Could you discuss the guidance on supplemental regulations? Yes, and for those of you following along on the job aid, you can find this section at the bottom of the second page. So let's turn to the actual substance of the advisory and start with the agency supplemental regulations. Interestingly, this part of the advisory was actually the easiest part. The answer was already written for us in the regulations at 2635-104A. This is the only place in the standards that addresses interagency detailees. The regulation tells us that when an employee is on an interagency detail assignment in excess of 30 calendar days, the supplemental agency regulations of the receiving agency rather than the home agency will apply. When OGE proposed this rule in 1992, two agencies objected to it because it would subject an employee on detail to another agency's supplemental regulations rather than to those of his or her employing agency and suggested instead that the detailees be required to comply with both agencies' supplemental regulations. Another agency was concerned that the employee on detail might acquire a financial interest that they could not retain after ending their detail because it would raise a potential conflict at their home agency. OGE concluded that because of the confusion that could result from different and possibly inconsistent requirements in two agencies' supplemental regulations, it would be impractical to subject an employee to both while on detail. Looking specifically at the investment activity concern, OGE opined that unless it would violate the home agency's statutory restriction, any problem posed by an employee's investment activity while on detail can be remedied by divestiture when the employee returns to their regular duties. You'll see this concept in the regulations at 2635-105D, which discusses special agency statutes. 
Thanks, Leah. Jenna, can you go over what the advisory says about the application of the standards of conduct to detailees? Absolutely. And for those of you looking at the job aid, this is discussed at the bottom of the first page. Now, to understand why we address the standards at all in this advisory, several provisions of the standards reference an employee's, quote, agency and, quote, official position. And as a result, those provisions will apply differently depending on an employee's exact agency and position. To illustrate, whether a person constitutes a prohibited source for a given employee under 2635203D is determined both by looking at the relevant person's interactions with the employee's agency, as well as by reference to that person's connection to the employee's official duties. Therefore, in order to determine a prohibited source for any given employee, ethics officials must understand both the agency and the employee's official duties. The standards don't address how these provisions apply in the context of interagency detailees. They're silent on this point. That being said, unlike agency supplemental regulations, which can differ between agencies and may conflict with each other, the standards are intended to apply uniformly across executive branch employees. With this background, we determined that the standard should apply to an interagency detailee as though they're employee of both agencies simultaneously. Can you expand on that idea? Well, it means that the standards as applied to both agencies apply to the employee while on detail. Note this is different from how supplementals are applied where only one agency supplemental applies at a time. For the standards, ethics officials should consider both the home and receiving agencies when questions arise. For example, imagining the education employee who goes to the State Department for six months, during that time, ethics officials will need to consider the prohibited sources both for education and for state when analyzing outside gifts for that employee. As we were reminded by agencies when we conferred with them on this issue, both agencies have interests at play for interagency detailees. While the State Department would have concerns due to their day-to-day -day oversight of the employee and ensuring their work is free of conflicts or the appearance of conflicts, education would have a continuing interest in ensuring that the employee is able to return to the agency free of conflicts and there are no actions taken on detail that could compromise the employee's work at education. Now, this doesn't mean that both agencies need to be consulted on every ethics question that arises for an interagency detailee, but when a question does arise, ethics officials should be cognizant that one or both agencies could have concerns relating to the question. And there may be times where it will be appropriate for both agencies to confer on a given ethics issue. Let me say that again. There may be times where both agencies should confer on a given ethics issue. So sometimes the ethics offices for the two agencies will need to coordinate to resolve ethics issues that arise during the detail. Correct. And this advisory also includes several helpful examples to illustrate these concepts in the real world. I'm going to spend a moment on the examples one and two. Um, I won't read them in their entirety, but this is the takeaway. In situations where ethics advice is needed, but it is clearly only needed due to one of the detailees assignments, either the home or the receiving, Officials should use their discretion to determine if coordination is necessary between the home and receiving agency. However, in any situation, it certainly never hurts to pick up the phone and check in. Now, example three in the advisory demonstrates a situation where the interests of both agencies are clearly implicated and therefore consultation should be pursued. In that example, an employee is offered an honorary degree from a university that does business with both agencies, so the university is considered a prohibited source at each agency. Given the university's relationship with both agencies and the agency's interests arising from that, that's a situation where it is appropriate for both agencies to confer on the ethics advice provided to the employee. Now, in terms of what this all means for agencies that send or receive interagency detailees, the takeaway is that agencies should expect to coordinate at times regarding the ethical obligations of interagency detailees. So if I'm understanding this correctly, there isn't really a one size fits all solution to the ethics considerations involving detailees. The ethics offices of both agencies should plan to coordinate and to 
in order to ensure that the detailee avoids any ethics issues. That's exactly right, Anna. Now, LA 2310 provides some suggested best practices to help agencies navigate this coordination. In particular, the advisory suggests having the receiving agency serve as the detailee's primary point of contact for ethics issues during the detail, and the receiving agency can then coordinate with the home agency, if appropriate, on the provision of advice. That being said, agencies should note that there are situations where the home agency must be consulted, in particular if a receiving agency believes a detailee requires a waiver under the conflict of interest laws, or if the receiving agency wishes to issue corrective action under the standards. Receiving agencies should also consult the home agency if a detailee is proposing to engage in an outside activity that may continue beyond the end of the detail. For example, if our education employee wants to join the board of a local nonprofit during their six month detail at state, but they're committing to a year long term, education would probably wanna know about that on the front end. But in general, whether to consult is a fact-based determination. When in doubt, agency should coordinate, therefore maintaining open lines of communication during an interagency's detail will be important and agencies should ensure that they do have appropriate points of contact. Thank you, Jenna. Leah, turning to you, I understand that the job aid also gives guidance for interagency detailees who file financial disclosures. That's right. So as we know, we have financial disclosure filers that can be broken down into two types. We have our public filers, our 278 filers, and then we have our confidential filers, our 450 filers. We discuss both of these types of filers at the top of page two in the job aid. Um, okay, so the Ethics in Government Act, or EGA, tells us who is required to file the public form, the 278. This also made our job a little easier in the legal advisory because we didn't have any room to change what it says. Only Congress passing a bill and the president signing it into law can change EGA. EGA tells us that public filers must file their reports with the DAO at the agency by which the reporting individual is employed. Because detailees remain fundamentally employed by their home agencies, detailees must file their public financial disclosure form with their home agency. Now, one can imagine a scenario where our education employee does not file the 278 at education, his home agency, but is required to file at state due to the nature of his position while on detail. Even in that scenario, the employee would file the 278 at education because education remains their employing agency. Is there different guidance for confidential financial disclosure filers? So turning to the confidential financial disclosure filers, we can look to the regulations at 5 CFR 2634 to see who files these forms. Similar to the public filers, employees who file a confidential financial disclosure form with their home agency should continue to do so while on detail. However, in a break from the public filers, confidential filers who are required to file a form solely because of their detailed position should file these forms with the receiving agency when serving in a covered position for more than 60 days. In these cases, the receiving agency is in the best position to identify and remedy any potential conflicts. Further, the home agency has already made the determination that this employee holds a position with their agency that does not require filing. Okay, so to recap, 278 filers should always file with their home agency. Confidential filers should also usually file with their home agency, except in the unusual circumstance where they only need to file a 450 uh, due to their detail assignment. In that specific circumstance, they should file with their receiving agency. That's right. But nonetheless, in that scenario and in all of the scenarios described above, ethics officials at both the home and receiving agency are encouraged to share relevant information from the detailee's financial disclosure report. 
Remember, these are tools intended to identify conflicts. And if you are reviewing an employee's form and notice something that could raise a potential conflict at the home or at the receiving agency, it is important to open up those lines of communication between ethics offices. Thanks, Leah. Jenna, can you discuss the advisory's guidance on ethics training for interagency detailees? Absolutely. So looking at the job aid, Discussions on training for interagency detailees are in the middle of page two. So as interagency detailees fundamentally remain an employee of their home agency, we've determined that it is most appropriate for the home agency to retain responsibility for ensuring that detailees receive any required ethics training. That being said, the home agency can meet that obligation by ensuring that the receiving agency has provided appropriate training to the interagency detailee. For example, if our hypothetical education employee is required to receive live annual ethics training under 2638-308, the employee does not necessarily need to go back to education to receive that training. They could instead receive live training while at state as long as it meets their training requirements, and that would serve to meet education's responsibility of ensuring their employees receive the required ethics training. As a best practice, LA 2310 also suggests that receiving agencies hold an initial ethics orientation with detailees to explain any supplemental regulations that may apply to them during the detail, as well as other general ethics issues that may arise during the detail. These orientations will ensure that detailees are familiar with the ethical standards of the receiving agency and also connect detailees with the receiving agency's ethics office. Well, uh, I think it's time to wrap up. Thank you for taking the time to discuss this. Um, any final thoughts on how ethics officials should handle detailees? Well, what we want the core takeaway for ethics officials to be is that interagency detailees can present unusual questions for agencies and that agencies should be ready to confer about those questions. Again, that is a very important takeaway. We want agencies to expect that they may need to confer about the ethical obligations of interagency detailees. To that end, agencies should keep lines of communication open when sending or receiving detailees. And of course, OGE is available to consult as necessary when questions regarding interagency detailees arise. Well, thank you again, Jen and Leah. We appreciate your taking the time to give some further information on this topic.